Thank you for joining us today. I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Alcohol, the Way You Define the Problem Influences Your Solution, featuring Dr. Dan Hungerford. At this time, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items for today's webinar. We would like to encourage you all to participate in today's webinar via three methods. First, if you have questions for Dr. Hungerford or are experiencing any technical issues, please use either the chat box or the questions pane to communicate your questions. Periodically throughout the presentation, Dr. Hungerford will stop and ask for questions, at which time I'll read aloud any questions that have been submitted. I'll also be periodically interrupting Dr. Hungerford with any uh, pertinent questions that have come in at that time. Again, you can submit all questions via the comment or questions box. Now, throughout the webinar, all participants will be on mute. If for any reason you would like to be unmuted, please click the raise your hand request and unmute your personal phone or mic. I, as the organizer, will unmute you to speak directly onto the webinar. You're also able to collapse and expand the GoToWebinar panel via the arrow button should you choose. One hour following the webinar, you will receive the evaluation and continuing education request information. This webinar is approved for 1.5 PACADC or NADAC credit. You can also request a general certificate of attendance. I will go over all of this again at the conclusion of our webinar. Now, today's slides will be made available to the attendees following the webinar. They will be posted with the recording as well as shared via email. At this time, I'd like to go through some poll questions. You should see the poll pop up on your screen. Our first question is, what is your current professional role? Are you a counselor, therapist, social worker, or case manager? A nurse, nurse practitioner, physician, or physician assistant. A program or unit administrator. A university student or faculty. Or other. If you select other, please feel free to let us know uh, what professional role you are in either the questions box or the chat panel. Okay, great. I just want to thank everyone for their participation in that poll. I'm just going to go ahead and share the results. 57% of our audience is either a counselor, therapist, social worker, or case manager. 2% is either a nurse, nurse practitioner, physician, or physician assistant. 13% a program or unit administrator. 7% a university student or faculty. And 20% selected other. I can see a couple responses coming into our questions box here for the other designation. We have a social science researcher, a prevention specialist, a expert network coordinator, another prevention specialist, an independent consultant, and a health educator. Our second question is, which field do you represent? Are you in mental health, addiction, physical health, education, or EAP? And again, if none of those uh, qualify for you, feel free to submit to the questions box or the chat panel. Okay, great. I just want to thank everyone again for participating in that poll, and I'll share the results with you. So it looks like our highest percentage is within the addictions field, and there's 45% of the audience representing that field. 32% uh, represent the mental health field, 15% represent education, and 8% represent physical health. I also have mental health and the field of prevention. I've come into the questions box. Now for our third poll question, do you currently conduct expert interventions? Okay, thank you for everyone who participated. I'm going to go ahead and share those results as well. 
like about 81% of our audience has selected no to conducting expert interventions. 19% selected yes. We also have a comment in here uh, that this individual does not conduct the expert interventions but trains others to do so. And for our last question, do you see your agency using expert? Okay, great. I just want to thank everyone for also participating in that poll. I'm just going to share those results with you. It looks like 71% of our audience does see their agency using SBIRT and 29% does not. Again, I want to thank everyone for completing those polls. I do want to let everyone know that we will be recording this webinar. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Hungerford holds a doctorate in nutritional epidemiology from the School of Public Health and the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. He has devoted his career to studying and promoting the implementation of alcohol screening and brief intervention in medical settings. Recently retired from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, he continues that effort part-time as a contractor in CDC's National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities on the Fetal Alcohol Syndrome Prevention Team. Dr. Hungerford, if you are ready, I can turn things over to you. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter. And you're, that looks great. I can see your screen. Okay, great. Well, thanks for attending today's presentation. As you've already heard, my name is Dan Hungerford, and I am retired from CDC, but continue to work there on the fetal alcohol syndrome prevention team on alcohol screening and brief interventions. And I've been working on alcohol screening and brief interventions since about 1993. My presentation today is about framing how we frame the issue of alcohol-related harm and how frames influence the solutions we favor. First, I'll present how the public has framed the issue over the last 150 years or so. That should provide some perspective on how the, about the fact that, uh, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting huge noises here. Are people You're coming on mute? Through clear. You're coming through clear on our end. Okay, good. I'll try to ignore them. It's it's a little disturbing. So loud. Maybe they maybe they've gone away. First, I'll present how the public has framed the issue over the last 150 years or so, and that should provide some perspective about the fact that how we view the issue now has not always been the case. In short things can and do change. This part of the presentation will also include what I consider to be the prevailing frame, the way the public currently views the issue. Next, I'll spend some time reviewing how our knowledge about alcohol-related harm has exploded in the last 50 or 60 years and how that has changed the frame that I use to understand solutions to the problem. Finally, I'll recount anecdotes from my two decades in the field that support my belief that the prevailing frame is still alive well and needs to be changed if we are to make significant progress. First of all, what's framing? Framing. Well, put simply, a frame is an explanatory metaphor that typically involves images, anecdotes, phrases, or words that help us understand and respond to our world. What I'm talking about is a conceptual framework that we use to understand the world. A frame is a mental representation or interpretation and simplification of reality that not only allows us to understand and respond to events, but frames also typically predispose us to particular solutions to problems. Generally, we're not aware of the frames we use. We don't even look at an event and apply a frame. 
we usually project frames on the world around us unconsciously. My goal today is to explore the different frames we use to understand the role that alcohol plays in the lives of individuals and our society. I'll start with a frame that has been useful to me and is often used in public health. This frame was originally used to understand infectious disease. The simple view is that germs cause diseases, so we should avoid germs. The uh, epidemiologic triad, which I'll refer to as the epi triad, expand, expands that very simple frame to help, to help us cope with infectious diseases more effectively. Germs are the agent of disease, but they can't cause disease without a host, individual people. So the host factor brings the idea of individual resistance and vulnerability to a particular germ into the picture. An environment also plays an important factor in the spread of disease. With the recent Ebola outbreak, we saw a case fatality rate close to 50 to 75 percent in Africa, but a much lower, almost non-existent rate for people who experienced Ebola in developed countries. In those countries, people were exposed to lower doses of the germ uh, and the medical system was much more advanced. So that gives us a sense of how the environment can play e even with respect to infectious diseases, whether we, the environment actually brings the host and the agent together so that disease can be caused. Let me apply the, this epi tri triad to our concerns about alcohol consumption. In this case, um, the agent is alcohol. For humans, it's a toxic substance which, if consumed in excess, causes a wide range of harm. Much more about that later. Besides, it's something this audience is likely to know a great deal about already. The hosts are drinkers. That's pretty obvious. And the environment is the drinking culture that exists in any particular society or subgroup of that society. The drinking environment is what gets the host, individual drinkers, and the agent, alcohol, together. And it's what gets the host exposed to the agent. What I want to explore briefly today is how the way society frames the problems associated with alcohol how that's varied a great deal over the past century or so. My goal is to highlight how our current views comprise a frame that predisposes us to a certain kind of response to the problems of risky drinking and uh, the problems those uh, that, that they pose, risky drinking poses to us in our society. In this period, alcohol consumption occurred mostly in and near saloons. Beer was the main alcohol-containing beverage widely available and affordable to the common man. Because it needed to be refrigerated, and uh, refrigeration wasn't something that people had had in their homes at this point in time, saloon is where people got it. Also, beer was made locally, and so uh, beer was made on a regular basis and consumed relatively rapidly after it was, after it was um, manufactured. Here's a, here's a picture in a bar, and uh, this is in the, in the late 19th or early 20th century. Um, uh, and it's obviously in a saloon. And um, by the late 1800s, long before prohibition, saloons were associated not only with drinking, but also with gambling, prostitution, illegal drugs, and organized crime. This is as early as the 1880s and the 1890s, long before prohibition occurred. If you didn't go to the saloon to drink, uh, you got it this way. These buckets were called growlers, which are coming back in trendy areas around the country, although they look a little different now. Now they're sealed bottles rather than some young boy walking with pails open 
at the top uh, with beer sloshing around in it between the bar and between the saloon and your house. Um, in this same era, women were fighting for the right to vote. And at the same time, they weren't all that happy about saloons. A lot of them uh, had problems at home because their husbands were spending too much time in saloons. And so they supported an organization called the Anti-Saloon League, which was really the major organization that brought about prohibition. In this period, the reaction to excessive alcohol consumption was dominated by the role that saloons played in our national life. For society at large, the alcohol problem wasn't just a problem of the agent, alcohol, or the fact that some individuals or hosts were more vulnerable to the evils of booze than others. The fundamental problem was saloons. The widespread belief was that if we got rid of or controlled saloons, that would be the solution. In, in the next era, as prohibition came along, the dominant frame uh, that saloons were really the basic fundamental problem morphed into something else. It wasn't enough to control the saloons. That was an incomplete solution. It became widely accepted that the root of the problem was alcohol itself, the agent and the epi triad that I presented earlier. To root out the problem, we had to ban the agent itself, the germ here. Alcohol itself was bad. So in terms of the whole nation, prohibition was voted in, in 1919. But prohibition had some success even before it was nationally uh, voted in by, by amendment. In 1905, there were three American states that had already outlawed alcohol. And by 1912, nine states outlawed alcohol. And by 1916, 26 of the 48 states had outlawed alcohol. So you can see the, the, the earlier frame of the saloon is the problem is morphing into a different fundamental belief or frame about what the fundamental problem is. It's morphing from, if we just get rid of saloons, we could solve this problem. And now people are saying, no, that's not enough. We really need to just ban alcohol. That's the problem. Alcohol is just bad. It's bad for everybody. The 19th Amendment was to the Constitution was ratified on January 16th, 1919. And the Volstead Act was the popular name for the National Prohibition Act, which was passed through Congress over President Woodrow Wilson's veto on October 28, 1990, 1919, and established the legal definition of intoxicating liquor. And the 19th Amendment went, actually went into effect on January 16th, a year after the amendment was passed in 1920. Then we started an era of which you probably are aware of, of the government raiding illegal sources of the manufacture of alcohol and pouring it down the drain. Uh, much later in our nation's life, we, we had a stamp uh, I think it says 1996, the uh, post office uh, issued this stamp commemorating prohibition and showed, showing people enforcing it. Uh, here's another sense of a raid. And notice on top of the roof there above these men, somebody taking a picture from another view, proof that uh, the federal government was enforcing prohibition. But as you know, the prohibition didn't last. Um, it ended with the ratification of the 21st Amendment on December 5th in 1933. Under the terms of that amendment, states were allowed to set their own laws 
for the control of alcohol. Uh, so you may not realize that the prohibition survived for a while in a few southern and border states. And there are still country, counties and parishes in the U.S. known as dry, where the sale of liquor, whiskey, wine, not beer, is prohibited. Several such municipalities have adopted liquor by the drink, however, in order to expand tax revenue. So we've morphed from a frame that said, you know, saloons are the fundamental problem to a frame where people are saying, no, it's the agent, alcohol, that's the fundamental problem. And now we're morphing into a new frame. And in the starting in around the middle 30s and in what I will call from balance of this presentation the, pre the prevailing frame. Uh, uh, it still exists today and it was started in terms of the public with the advent of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, started by Bill Wilson to the left and Dr. Will, Bob Smith on the right. Alcoholics Anonymous really set the stage for the understanding that it wasn't alcohol that was really the problem. It wasn't really where people drank or the culture uh, of drinking saloons that was the problem. The problem was the individual. There were individuals in the United States or in our society who were uniquely vulnerable to alcohol. And if they drank, they would become alcoholics. And this was uh, something that uh, became uh, canon in the United States, became uh, the frame through which people understood the problem of alcohol. And uh, I'll note here that it was also a frame that was uh, amenable or endorsed by the alcohol industry. The belief that there's just a small percentage of the population who are vulnerable to becoming alcoholics. Uh, alcoholics Anonymous still exists. It's a major and important organization. And it's ad adapted to the times. Here's uh, one way it's adapted. Um, it's, uh, this is an app that people can put on their cell phones to help them remain abstinent. Um, the alcoholism model or frame or paradigm is basically a dichotomous model. We actually in this country had for a short period of time stopped lights that looked like this. Just had a red light and a green light. And the dichotomous model basically said, well, if the red light is on, meaning you're an alcoholic, you're uniquely vulnerable to alcohol and you shouldn't drink at all. And really the only way for you to deal with it is for you to be abstinent for the rest of your life. And alcoholism is a chronic relapsing disorder. So if you're not abstinent, you're going to relapse and you're going to have all the kinds of problems that you used to have uh, before you became abstinent uh, if you don't stay abstinent. Um, so, and the, the, the green part of this wasn't really ever stated very much out loud, but it's what the public began to understand, which was the fundamental question really was, are you an alcoholic? And if the answer was yes, then you had to toe the AA line or something very much like the AA line. Even if you went into specialty treatment, it was the AA model. And the, the flip side of the AA model without ever really uh, spelling it out to people was, well, I'm not an alcoholic, so I'm not really vulnerable to alcohol, so really I don't really have to think that much about alcohol. It's not a problem for me. So what what people thought was, All right, am I an alcoholic? No. Well, then it's not a problem. Well, in 1948, uh, 
actual science entered the picture in a couple of different ways. First of all, um, clinical trials uh, entered the picture. In 1948, uh, the first published randomized clinical trial uh, occurred, and I'll talk about that in a minute. In the middle 60s, there were early indications that BIs, or brief interventions, actually may work. And the first population studies, uh, studies not of people who were uh, presenting for treatment, or uh, people who were in medical settings, but people uh, studies about uh, how much people drank and the extent to which that was associated with harm uh, uh, in the general population. Those studies started in the, around the middle 60s and have continued up until the present day, and I'll, I'll cover how they've affected our knowledge. In 1970, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism was established, which is a major funding arm for research associated with alcohol abuse and alcoholism. And, uh, uh, well, I'll talk more about that in a bit. And then in uh, the late 70s, the first true brief intervention studies occurred in both the United States and in England. The first randomized clinical uh, randomized clinical trial was published in 1948, and it was for streptomycin for the treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis. And what this meant was we finally had a scientific way of of evaluating whether a particular treatment worked. We randomized patients into different groups, people getting the treatment or people not getting the treatment. And we could, because we randomized them, we, we realized that those groups should be equivalent because we didn't choose them on the basis of any characteristic, we just randomly chose them. And if the intervention worked with the experimental group, then we could attribute the fact that people in that group got better at a greater rate than the people in the control group. We could attribute their better outcome to the fact that they actually got the treatment. And what we began to find was that a lot of things, that a lot of treatments that we were using really didn't work. But also, we also had a yardstick and a gold standard for evaluating treatment. Um, in the late 70s, uh, we, we have the first true uh, brief intervention uh, study from England of two groups. One group uh, had several months. We didn't, we didn't uh, compare, in this case, a group of people getting an alcohol-related type treatment and another group that was getting nothing. We were comparing two different kinds of treatment. Uh, one group was getting several months of in and outpatient treatment, and the other group was getting one counseling session. And this was on a not on a general group of people who were alcoholics. It was on married alcoholics, and these people were alcoholics. And they followed these people for over a year, and a year later they found there was no significant difference in the outcomes between the two groups, which confounded the scientists because they didn't really expect that one counseling session was going to have an effect that was the equivalent of several months of in and outpatient treatment. But it did. Uh, these were married alcoholics, so maybe some of the intervention, and they were men, maybe some of the intervention was happening at home. Um, in the United States, uh, Bill Miller started doing uh, studies uh, of uh, randomized studies of brief interventions, and he didn't start out with brief interventions. He just uh, started uh, comparing groups that were getting briefer interventions with groups that were getting longer interventions, uh, because maybe he had some sense that 
you know, 28-day inpatient wasn't really that much better than something, than outpatient, or that long-term outpatient wasn't that much better than just a few counseling sessions. Now, this wasn't brief interventions as we think of it today. It was four one-hour interventions. This study published in 2000 is a, a, a review of 30 years of his work, and the most important results were that relatively brief interventions can trigger significant change, and that increasing the intensity of treatment doesn't consistently improve outcome. And thirdly, therapist empathy can be a potent predictor of client change. In other words, empathy on the part of the, uh, of the therapist might be part of the effective ingredient of the, of the intervention or of the treatment. And finally, that a single empathic counseling session can substantially enhance the outcome of subsequent treatment. The unstated but important result of both of these was that randomized trials are a good yardstick. They can make you change your mind that science works. All of a sudden, science was uh, convincing uh, two major researchers one in the United States and one in England, that what they believed about treatment wasn't necessarily true. In 1990, uh, the Institute of Medicine published this large tome, a huge book, entitled Broadening the Base of Treatment for Alcohol Problems. And uh, notice at the title of the report, uh, designated the condition to be treated as alcohol problems, not alcohol abuse, alcoholism, or alcohol use disorder. This is because the authors wanted, as the title implied, to broaden the base of treatment from just alcohol dependence. However, still today, if someone is labeled as having an alcohol problem, it's typically just a polite way of saying that he or she is an alcoholic. But anyway, uh, this marked a big advance in, in uh, thinking about how to deal with uh, the problem of alcohol, not just for individuals, but in society as a whole. Um, it recommended a two-part treatment system. The first part of the treatment system, well, let me say, the second part of the treatment system was the one that already existed, the specialty treatment system. It was for people who had severe problems. It was for people who had a prior history of alcohol dependence. And it was for people who had uh, alcohol-related comorbidity, liver damage, mental illness, other problems that, that, severe, that, that made uh, getting better, improving their condition, difficult. But the other part of the treatment system, the second part, which I've labeled one here, um, was a, a community-based uh, uh, part, uh, part of the system they were recommending. They were recommending public health screening of people to see if they were experiencing alcohol-related problems they were trying to identify people early in the sequence of alcohol-related problems. And the screening could happen in multiple settings, in medical settings, in social work settings, and you know, you name it. Uh, and the people who had less severe problems were, should get brief interventions because really they weren't appropriate for specialized treatment. And the people who had more severe problems, we were identifying more of them with this broad-based community screening, they could be funneled into the specialty treatment uh, system. This um, looks a lot like uh, the ASPER program uh, funded by SAMHSA, but it's 14 years earlier. Um, they, the, uh, the report also helped disseminate what we learned from epidemiologic studies um, was really a spectrum of alcohol use problems. At one end of the spectrum were people who 
uh, were life were abstinent lifetime, never drunk anything at all. And at the other end of the spectrum were people who were addicted, alcoholics. Then, then uh, the next level in the spectrum were people who had problems in the past but were currently abstinent. They probably were alcoholics or maybe were on their way to becoming alcoholics. And anyway, they had problems with it and they decided that they weren't going to drink anymore because they didn't want to have those problems. So right at the moment, they were fine. But maybe because of their past history, they weren't really quite the same group of people as the people with lifetime abstinence. Then there was a group of people who were drinkers, uh, but they were low-risk drinkers. And this group wasn't really a homogeneous group either, because maybe there were some people who had in the past problems with alcohol, but they'd cut back on their drinking. And now they weren't having problems, but they continued drinking. And then, of course, there were a lot, a lot of people in this pub, in this group, uh, in this yellow group here, that uh, were drinking. But you know, they were drinking so little that, in most cases, it just wasn't associated with problems. Then we have a group of people who were drinking really too much. And in fact, epidemiologically, we studied those people, and we knew that if they continued to drink at this level, that they were probably going to have problems associated with their drinking in the future. So we would call them risky drinkers or hazardous drinkers or at-risk drinkers, meaning they, they hadn't experienced harm as a result of their drinking yet, but if they kept it up, the chances were pretty good that they would. Then we have harmful drinkers. There are drinkers who already are you know, they've already experienced some drinking, some harm related to their drinking. Maybe health-related harm. Maybe uh, they've had a DUI. Maybe they've had problems in their relationships or problems at work. Maybe they've had some legal troubles. Maybe they've had troubles with money. But uh, their alcohol has already had a harmful impact on their life and perhaps also a harmful impact on other people's lives. And then we have people who've already experienced dependent symptoms, but they haven't experienced them that often, or they haven't experienced that many dependent symptoms that they really can't support a diagnosis of alcohol dependence or addiction. But boy, they're really on that slippery slope and on their way. One of the things the spectrum doesn't talk about, however, is something that's huge in our society and that's intoxication. And that is a huge major problem with uh, drinking too much. And we'll talk more about that in the future. But what I want to say is, is that the Institute of Medicine back in the 90s really introduced us to the idea that we didn't really anymore have that two light stoplight, either you're an alcoholic or you're not an alcoholic, there's this gradation across the spectrum. Now this was uh, simplified by John Higginsbill in the middle 90s this way uh, to abstainers, low-risk drinkers, high-risk drinkers, and probable alcohol dependence, and he's put uh, uh, the percentage of the population that are in these different groups. And on the left, he's given audit scores, which is sort of the gold standard screening instrument for uh, al alcohol-related problems. Audit stands for Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test. Um, and so he's put audit scores and that screening instrument uh, sort of that sort of correlate with these different groups of people. I simplified that in about 2006 using epidemiologic data even more simply because I wanted to match this up with uh, the three different types of interventions, meaning the low-risk group we either don't have an intervention with at all or we do what we call bibliotherapy. We give them a handout or some written material saying, you know, this is the amount of drinking that we think is maybe safe. And then the risky and harmful people get a brief, brief 
uh, intervention and the people who were addicted get uh, funneled into the specialty treatment system. So now we have, we've moved from that two light stoplight into this three light stoplight. And we've got um, uh, addicted people in the red and we've got all those people who are in this middle group of about 25% of the population in the yellow and uh, about 70, 70, 71 percent of the population in the green. This is a, a little bit more accurate uh, representation. But one of the problems is that we have, I've had for 20 plus years, is we don't have any label for people in this middle group, this yellow group. We don't have any way to refer to them. You know, the public is used to alcoholic or alcohol abuse or alcohol problems or not. They're used to thinking about it in a dichotomous way, uh, a light switch way, on or off. And so we don't have a label on, uh, of saying, well, you know, there's this, there are a lot of people who have problems associated with alcohol, but they're really not alcoholics. And... Um, but they're not really drinking at safe levels, and they've probably already experienced some harm. Uh, and so the, because of that, because we don't have a label to talk about this, uh, it's difficult to shift the frame or shift the paradigm for the general public. So they're still stuck in the two-category frame or model or the two-category paradigm. Uh, they're a way of thinking about the issue. So I want to go now to another piece of, uh, I want to uh, back up and say, okay, we're thinking that about 4% of the population is addicted or alcoholic or could sustain a diagnosis of alcohol dependence. And about 25% or six times as large a group um, has, has problems, you know, is, is they're risky drinkers, let's call them that. Um, but that 4% isn't who we think it is. And epidemiologic data, studying the whole population, has told us this. What we found from, the, from NISARC, the National Epidemiologic Study of Alcohol-Related Conditions, was um, that about 70% of people with a dependence diagnosis have one episode of less than four years. So it's not chronic. For, for almost three quarters of the people who are in that 4% of the population, it's not a chronic condition. They have one episode. And about 75% of that 70% group recover fully, and about half of that 70% group still drinks at low risk levels without dependent symptoms. And even more astonishing is that 75% or three quarters of those who recover do so without any kind of help, not Alcoholics Anonymous, not getting counseling for the, from the rabbi or pastor, or going to any kind of help group or specialty, specialty treatment. And only 13% of all the people who, were who could support a diagnosis in the population of alcohol dependence ever got any kind of specialty treatment. So when we look back at, uh, at this, uh, that 4% isn't who we think it is. It isn't the stereotypical view of the alcoholic. Most of them are going to slide back into the green group or the orange group. And most of them are going to do it without any help of any kind. So let's look at the results that uh, we've learned from epidemiology. First, 
Alcohol dependence is 4% of the population. Most of them recover without help, do not relapse. relapse. Many continue to drink. They're symptom-free at low risk levels. The implications of this are that specialty treatment is probably unnecessary and inappropriate for most people who are alcoholics. Happy summary two, results. 25% of the population is drinking too much but not alcoholic. That means that there are six non-alcoholic heavy drinkers per alcoholic in the population. The implication is that by focusing on alcoholics, we can solve just a small part of society's alcohol problem. And that's very different from what I would, what I'll call the, the prevailing paradigm. Um, the, the prevailing paradigm is if you're an alcoholic, you need to be in treatment, and that, that solves the problem. It's not that, it's not just a problem with alcoholics. And in fact, we could cure 100% every alcoholic, and we would have solved just a small part of the problem. Even though alcoholics, on average, are each each individual alcoholic is in quote worse shape than each uh, individual person who's drinking too much and not alcoholic. There are six times as many of those in the middle group or the yellow group or in the group that we don't have a label for. So even though they experience less harm and they deal out less harm to other people around them, there's six times as many of them. So that's a huge problem for society. So this, this comes to my forehead smack reframe myself, which happened, I guess, sometime around 2008. And I was sitting in my office, and I, I had created both of these diagrams uh, for presentations that I made to a wide variety of uh, groups of people. Uh, some people who were chemical dependency people, uh, counselors, uh, mental health people, social workers, and uh, other groups that were more uh, nurses, physicians, health, uh, health professionals, uh, people who weren't you know, dealing with alcohol on a day-to-day -day basis in a treatment capacity. And some presentations were just the general public. So I was trying to change the paradigm from what I call the alcoholism paradigm or frame to something more like one of these two figures. And I wasn't making much problem progress. And one of the one of the issues was that it was hard for people to to get that there's this middle group, this larger group in the middle of the spectrum that represented a major, probably the major part of the problem. Uh, when, I, when I got to questions, or I left and then saw people later, they kept defaulting to the end of the spectrum as a real problem, by which they meant where we really need to focus our, our attention on alcoholics. I mean, it made sense to them and a lot, and a lot of people. You pay attention first to the people with the worst problem, right? And since you don't really have enough resources to deal with the whole problem, you stop there. Or you think you're dealing, what you're dealing with is the whole problem, or at least the lion's share of the problem. And all of a sudden, I, uh, while I was sitting there in my office that day, I remembered that in most presentations that I had given, people always wanted to know why we need drinking thresholds for both a, uh, on a day basis you know, a daily drinking threshold or a single day threshold and for a week. And why do we need both of those? And uh, that's the point at which I smacked my head and I said to myself, uh, I've drunk the Kool-Aid. I was still framing the problem with the graphical aids which short-circuited my thinking in my presentations, these two aids here. The triangle or the pyramid has a peak. And the peak, the end of the spectrum, really defines the problem, not what's in the middle. But I could reframe the issue by thinking about chronic effects. Read weekly consumption. 
uh, a marker or a proxy for average longer term drinking and therefore uh, the consequences that come from average excessive drinking and I could reframe it by thinking about acute effects of alcohol read daily or binge consumption or which really represents potential intoxication after all most of my career at CDC was in its injury center working with emergency medicine and trauma surgery folks and they're the people who saw people who were drinking too much in a day or drinking too much in a short period of time and ended up in the emergency department or in trauma surgery they were very familiar with so I started to reframe uh, graphically reframe the problem. I said to myself, you know, really there's two types of drinking too much. There's drinking too much in a single day or in a short period of time and that leads to intoxication and that has really different types of outcomes than sort of average alcohol intake over a longer period of time. So the proxy for that or the marker for that in uh, epidemiologic surveys and also in terms of uh, screening instruments is how much do you drink in a week and that represents repeated toxic exposure to, of cells and tissues in the body to too much alcohol because uh, alcohol is a toxic molecule the body actually has a system for detoxifying that molecule but it can get overwhelmed if people drink too much so well first uh, moving on first I want to say that um, too much in, too, in a single day and too much in a week or they overlap a lot but they're conceptually useful uh, they're, they're useful concepts because they have such different outcomes of course somebody who drinks too much in a single day and does it a whole lot is going to drink too much in a week but for conceptual purposes I want to separate the two because they have different mechanisms um, let's look at too much in a single day uh, or too much in a short period of time uh, that leads to intoxication and intoxication decreases coordination that means uh, when you're driving your car you can't uh, get your foot on the brake quickly enough when you see something happen because you you can't control your body very well and it leads to decreased cognitive function which means that uh, when you're driving your car you didn't recognize that you were going around that curve too fast it, you recognize that a lot more slowly than you would have if you hadn't been drunk um, so a you didn't recognize you were going too fast uh, soon enough and secondly you couldn't get your brake to your foot to the brake as fast as you normally would and thirdly intoxication uh, leads uh, to increased tech, uh, risk taking which means that when you got into your car you knew you could drive as fast as you always drive because uh, you know you weren't in your normal state of mind you weren't you weren't as careful as you might be if you hadn't been drinking and of course that leads to all sorts of outcomes with which I'm going to call the acute effects of uh, drinking too much in a short period of time let's look at the other arm of this too much in a week or repeated toxic exposure to cells and tissues throughout the body which leads to Cell, cellular and tissue damage well that leads to all the kinds of medical problems uh, well the chronic medical problems that are associated with with drinking too much uh, not only the one that everybody knows liver problems but also gastrointestinal problems heart disease problems hypertension um, gastrointestinal esophageal reflux um, cancer um, on and on you name it um, okay, so let's look at yeah before you go on we do have one question that's come in okay great um, 
are the folks at the top of the 25% mid-triangle more impaired than those at the bottom? Uh, more impaired, hmm, more impaired, um, I guess my first thought, my first reaction is more impaired when? When they drink, on a single occasion of drinking, uh, the, uh, the, they're probably about equally impaired, but the people in the top think that they're not. The question uh, is in regards to more impaired over time. Over time. Well, the people in the, the orange and the green, if they drink too much and have one occasion of intoxication and they don't have them in the future, they may be as impaired in that very short term as people in the 4%, but if they don't get drunk again, they're not going to, and their chances of having chronic outcomes from one or very uh, widely spaced instances of drinking too much are, are little. But um, in terms of the impairment, uh, people in the 4% often think they can handle their alcohol. And as people uh, slide down that slippery slope from the 25% to the 4%, they say, I can handle my alcohol. But what what research shows us is that um, the alcoholic can often drive home from the bar pretty drunk and make it home successfully because he has a predetermined route that he takes and if nothing unusual happens, he does all right. But if something unusual happens, he's drastically impaired and can't deal with it well at all. So if all of a sudden he starts to go through an orange light and another car is approaching and is going to go through, his ability to react to that is, is very impaired, it's much more so than somebody lower down on the triangle or in the spectrum. And if he, for some reason, loses his way, on home, uh, his way home, his ability to reestablish his root and, and get unconfused is much, much more impaired. So he may think he can hold his alcohol or he may be able to walk a straight line a lot longer than somebody down, but his cognitive ability is, is much more impaired. And there's just one additional question here. So if you're sure. on the border of red and yellow, are you in mm -hmm. worse shape than at the bottom of yellow? Well, <laughs> and this is um, it, these things smear into each other. But it, uh, that, that's a good question because it really it really um, begs me to differentiate this group. You know, if you look at the graphic to the left, uh, the smack my head really. <laughs> where I, I think that people can see that where I am, right? where the two graphics are opposite, right, Sarah? Yes, that's correct. OK. So it's better to look at it over, not look at the triangle, but look at, at the things on the left in the, in the spectrum. People who are uh, doing uh, excessive drinking but haven't already experienced harmful uh, drinking, they haven't yet experienced harm as a result of their drinking. Um, they may well function, they're much more likely to function better than people who are in uh, farther down in uh, in the spectrum. But that really depends on a whole lot of other factors, whether they're male or female, uh, their genetic predisposition, uh, how uh, how how much are they drinking? There are people who are still uh, there are young people in their 18, 19, 20-year-olds who drink a whole lot and get drunk a whole lot, but yet haven't, haven't yet experienced harm as a result of it. But they're incredibly impaired. So they're not farther down on the spectrum, but their risk of getting farther down on the spectrum is still quite high. I don't know if that helps. Okay, well, let me, let me pick up where I was. 
which was to start to look at some of the effects. And here is a list of the acute effects. And I don't really want to go over these in detail, but one of the things that you can see here is these are the kinds of things that end up in emergency departments and trauma centers. You know, crashes that are so, car crashes that are so bad that uh, the ambulance uh, calls into the emergency department and this, this person gets triaged to the operating room with a trauma surgeon uh, and doesn't even really go through an emergency physician before to get to the, to the trauma center. Um, um, these are all things that because a person is intoxicated or so impaired that they're doing stupid things and uh, you know their their sense of risk is decreased, and their ability to think is decreased, and their ability to control their body is decreased, and so all these things result. And then we have the chronic effects. Now people can drink relatively low amounts and still begin to experience a lot of these chronic effects. Uh, you know, and they may not experience them until they're in their 30s or 40s or 50s, and they may may not even be in the uh, alcohol dependent, but they just drink and their average alcohol intake over a long period of time is such, and their uh, all the other factors in their life are such that their uh, cells and tissues in their bodies start failing. And these are the kinds of things that we see in the medical system, in specialty settings, and in primary care. And then there's where I live at CDC, uh, well, at least the first one is, uh, which is fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Uh, if a woman gets uh, heavily intoxicated a, a one or a, a few times early in her pregnancy before she's uh, even though she's pregnant, uh, you can result, you can have results that uh, fetal alcohol result uh, spectrum results, uh, and we have to remember that uh, about 50% of pregnancies are unplanned, and women don't know they're pregnant for um, you know four, six, or more weeks after they are pregnant, and that damage to the fetus can happen throughout the whole nine months and the early and the early weeks are, are critical although all the, all the weeks are critical and then of course and that, that's not so uh, the average amount that, that a woman drinks during pregnancy and the average and the and her acute amount that she drinks uh, affect the fetal outcomes. And that's true also with medication interactions. You know, the average amount that you drink and whether you drink a lot in individual uh, occasions can affect uh, whether medications work too well or whether what medications don't work well enough or whether there's an interaction that gives you uh, um, bad uh, outcomes. So here's the whole... Yep. Could you just clarify, do the chronic effects apply to low-risk drinking as well? The chronic effects, um, well, this is something that we is, is not studied as well as the acute effects because we don't, uh, the, epidemiologically, the data we have about alcohol is rather crude. And in medical settings, uh, and I'm going to make a, a plea to medical settings that uh, this is a medical issue. Um, in most medical settings, they don't uh, they don't find out how much their patients are drinking at all. They just assume that they're not drinking too much, or they assume that they're alcoholics, and they don't do that on the basis of any scientific screening or anything like that. They just think they know. And there's a lot of research to show that they miss lots and lots of people. That's why we're pushing screening. Um, but so we don't really know. Well, 
let me let me back up. It's a it's a really complicated question because the chronic effects are so many, and uh, they may be different for different outcomes. For example, we do know that uh, if people drink above the NIAAA, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, uh, single day and uh, single week drinking thresholds, that if they drink above that, both of those, uh, about half of them will get to the point where they'll be, um, they could sustain a diagnosis of alcohol dependence. We know that for that one outcome, but we don't know nearly as precisely what the, what the risk percentage is for uh, different kinds of cancer, for uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, for uh, esophageal and uh, mouth cancer, for um, a variety of cardiac outcomes, for hypertension, we know some things about those, but uh, we don't know as much. And part of the reason we don't know as much is because on people's medical records, we don't know how much they're drinking. So we can't do epidemiologic studies to find out what amount of drinking correlates with what health outcomes. So it's kind of a squishy answer, but I hope it's helpful. So anyway, here's the whole, the whole picture of what I call the new frame, the acute chronic health effects frame. I haven't got a good label, simple label for it. But I think it's a big advantage over what we had. The, the prevailing view is still alcoholics are the problem. The reframe is, my reframe is, the fundamental problem really is drinking too much. And the problem with that is that people don't, pe people don't know how much is too much. So um, let me make a little bit of uh, an argument about how, why I think the prevailing paradigm is still the alcoholism paradigm. I've been doing this for 20 years and talked to lots of people in lots of situations. And at first, and still, uh, people's reaction is, well, you know, if they've got problems with alcohol, just get them in treatment. And I uh, then would explain maybe that, well, you know, there's this whole group of people that don't have problems that are quite as severe as people who are alcoholic or alcohol dependent. And their reaction is, well, just lower the bar for treatment. In other words, get them into treatment. Get them into specialized treatment. Uh, when I, I did uh, research at, at a large public health hospital here in Atlanta, and I did a grand rounds in the emergency department, and I was uh, I was doing research in the emergency department to see if we could do alcohol screening and brief interventions there. And uh, they were really receptive because, believe me, trauma surgeons and emergency departments or uh, physicians and nurses are overwhelmed with alcohol problems. They know it's a huge problem. Um, but they think the problem is alcoholics. And number two, they think they know everybody who's an alcoholic. They can just tell. Uh, I did this grand rounds and tried to uh, talk about the spectrum and that there was this middle group of people who had problems. and uh, We needed to be identifying them and helping them with brief interventions. And I was down in the emergency department a week later, and uh, one of the physicians who was uh, in a higher level in the emergency department said, uh, oh, Dr. So-and-so, come on over. I want you to meet uh, Dr. Hungerford. He works with alcoholics. You know, people default to that. Uh, when I give a presentation somewhat similar to what I'm doing right now, the first question is, this will never work with alcoholics. That's not what I was talking about. I was saying that there's a wider spectrum and people need different interventions. Uh, the first thing that happens is, well, we don't have anybody to refer to. Well, that's a legitimate concern for a small proportion of your patients. But the largest proportion of your patients 
don't need to be referred. They need an intervention right then and there. And they need a brief intervention. Another reaction is, this isn't medicine, it's mental health or substance abuse treatment. You know, this isn't what doctors do. This isn't seen by most medical people as a medical issue. It's a substance abuse issue, or it's a mental health issue. But if you, if this was, oh no, help me, Sarah. <laughs> You just want to open it back up into, there you go. Yeah. I have to go through it all over. If this was their paradigm, they would realize that it's a medical issue. Look at all the things on the right-hand side. Addiction is just one of them. It's an important thing. It's a huge issue for the country. But it's it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's not the iceberg. Okay. <laughs> okay, where was I? So, last of all, uh, when I talk to other people in state government or federal government, everybody says, I didn't know CDC worked with alcohol. You know, that's an IAAA or that's SAMHSA. In other words, the people who work with alcoholism, people who work with addiction. When it's alcohol, it's them. It's not CDC, which by and large means it's not really a medical issue. It's a substance abuse issue. So, almost finished. What people need to know is how much is too much, and they don't know, believe me. Uh, again and again, I, uh, in presentations, ask people, and particularly physicians and nurses, could they tell their patients how much is too much? They don't have a clue. And they need to believe it. My experience has been, I talk to two kinds of audiences. One is a general audience, and that includes medical people. And the other is an audience that has a lot of social workers and chemical dependency people and treatment people. And when I talk about the NIAAA drinking guidelines, I get two different kinds of reactions. When I say they can, uh, a man can drink up to 14 drinks a week and a woman up to seven, and uh, uh, a man can drink up to four drinks a day and up to three. I should say four in a single day, and a woman can drink up to three in a single day. But they still have to limit themselves to the weekly amount. That means so that if they drink, if a guy drinks four on Friday, Saturday, and Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and that's 12 drinks, he's got three drinks left to stay within limits for the rest of the week. Well, when I when I lay that out to people, a general audience says, a general audience is silent, and they look at each other, or there's laughter, and you can look at the people, and, and they're looking at each other, and some of the more bold ones say, that's not very much, and you can see some of them saying to themselves, jeez, I drink that much already. I, I can't believe that. That can't be right. And then when I talk to people who are working with people who are alcoholics, they go, well, that's way too much. We shouldn't be telling people they can drink that much. That's way too much. On the other hand, if they were only drinking that much, they wouldn't be in treatment. So we need to be able, we need to, people need to know how much is too much and we need to present the science to them in such a way that they can believe it. And finally, health professionals should be the way. It's hard to, for me to believe that the, that the paradigm or the frame that people use to think about alcohol in this society is going to change without health professionals leading the way or changing the way they think about it. And it reminds me of the 40s and the 50s when I was growing up. And this is what you saw in Life magazine. 
or you know the magazines of the day more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette and it took 20 plus years 30 plus years for that to really change but when doctors when the medical profession really realized that smoking was a major problem in this society and people shouldn't smoke it didn't happen until the middle 60s and for a lot of doctors it didn't happen until the 70s and we didn't see changes in in the general society really much until the 80s and 90s when my kids were growing up in the 80s you'd go to a restaurant and some restaurants had non-smoking sections but uh, you'd still smell smoke all over the restaurant because the non-smoking section was small but now you can find tons of restaurants that have no smoking whatsoever. It was huge change, but it took decades. I don't think the kind of changes we want for alcohol, not to prohibit alcohol, but to have people understand how much is too much and to moderate the amount that they're drinking, is going to take decades. And it's not going to change if we, if the major paradigm that people understand it is the alcohol paradigm, which is what people understand it by now. So I'll finish there and open to more questions. Sure. So one of the questions that have, have come in is, how does brain research or gene research fall into this new framework? Well, I think that <laughs> I might get myself in hot water here, but I think that how that uh, how that fits into it fits into it because there are a whole group of scientists who are particularly interested in addiction and not very interested in population-based epidemiology who think that there's a, a biomedical fix to this and that if we could just find the gene or if we could just find the right med or whatever we could fix it um, but I don't think it's a brain disease I think that there are genes involved and they're important, but I think it's it's a combination. Let me go back to the epidemiologic triad, which is it's a function of alcohol being a toxic ingredient to anybody who drinks too much. And there are variations in the population in terms of not only vulnerability, but um, I'm blanking on the word that's the opposite of vulnerability, but help me, Sarah. Um, resistance, hardiness. There, there, are very, there is variation in the population on both vulnerability and hardiness. So biology and brain science and genes will help there but it'll never overcome the fact that uh, alcohol is basically a toxic molecule, molecule that's very small and can go anywhere in the body and damages tissues. It won't, and it won't get over the fact that anybody who drinks too much, whether they're, quote, predisposed or not, uh, gets intoxicated. And that leads to the, th the three the three horsemen of the apocalypse, which is these kind of decreased body, uh, control your body, decreased uh, cognitive ability, and increased risk taking. And you're never going to get around that. And then you're never going to get around the fact that the drinking culture influences the way people drink. And right now we have a drinking culture that glorifies getting drunk. You know, I, I, my children grew up with people that felt like you weren't having a good time unless you were getting drunk. That was the culture they grew up in in the 80s, and it's not gotten a whole lot better. We need a cultural change. I don't think we're going to get that cultural change until we change the paradigm, the frame. Okay, another question? Um, how does this model apply to adolescents? Well, the model applies to adolescents, I think. Um, I think it's a, it's a big... Adolescents are a major concern, and 
now that I'm not really formally part of government, I can I can say publicly that government is afraid to work with anybody but adolescents because the alcohol industry is so powerful. The alcohol industry has given a pass to governmental agencies to work with adolescents. Uh, but the reality is, I don't. Uh, adolescence is a period in, in life, always was, always will be, when people when people experiment with what it's like to be an adult. And part of what it's like to be an adult is to drink for a lot of people. And unless the drinking culture changes, I don't think that focusing on adolescence is going to help a lot. You will help some, and we do need to focus on adolescents. But the problem with adolescents is that adolescents mimic adults. And the, and the developmental task of being adolescent is to figure out, to try lots of different things to figure out what, what you want to be like as you, as you turn into an adult. Your task as an adolescent is to experiment. And your models are other adults around you. And the, and the culture that you grew up in. So I think, again, I think that we can make limited uh, progress with adolescents, but it won't, if, if we sort of say, if the government gets passed to work with adolescents but is afraid really to work in a major sort of way with adults, uh, back to the happy triad, which means uh, taxation on uh, different levels of drinking. Uh, in Norway, when you go to drink, for example, if you're drinking whiskey, uh, the taxes are higher per drink than they are if you're drinking 3.2 beer. Uh, because they know you're going to get intoxicated much quicker with whiskey. You know, we need primary prevention things, uh, the equivalent of what we have in smoking. You know, primary prevention and smoking is uh, a lot of people just, they, they can't smoke at work anymore. They can't smoke in a lot of restaurants. They know the smoking's bad for them. They've tried five times. You know, I have a son who's going through this. He uh, tried five times to quit, but it's become such a hassle to smoke in society that a lot of people have stopped. Well, you know, uh, the, the culture about smoking has changed dramatically in the last 30 and 40 and 50 years. Uh, adolescence, the problem with adolescence isn't really going to be so solved unless the drinking culture changes. Because alcohol is a toxic molecule, it's not going to change. And individuals, and even though they vary across the population, they're not going to change. What changes and what's going to change is the drinking culture. And I don't think that culture is going to change as long as people in the medical profession don't think of alcohol as a serious medical issue. Not a substance abuse issue, although it's that as well, but a medical issue. A physician, if a physician has a patient with hypertension, that physician should know how much that patient is drinking. So, anyway. Okay. Other questions? The next question here, um, and if I don't uh, articulate this question correctly, feel free to resubmit to the question box. But is the category one falls into based on their self-report, and is addiction a condition of minimizing and denial? Well, um, <laughs> research has shown that uh, that addiction is not a uh, an issue of denial, although people, AA has taught people that for decades and most people believe that's true. I'll give you an example, uh, again an anecdote. When I was first doing this, I was uh, working with uh, master's level social work students at Clark Atlanta University, a historically black uh, university uh, college. Uh, in Atlanta, and I was having them go to see if we could screen people using the audit in the emergency department for how much they're drinking. They've been brought up through the social work department, and their reaction was, well, these people aren't going to tell us that 
how much they're drinking, you know, uh, denial. That's a fundamental characteristic of being an alcoholic. That's what they learned. Uh, so at the very beginning, I had them go. I said, well, let's just go. We'll go into the waiting room. We'll see if we can get some people over in the corner and give them the audit. And a week later, we met again, and I asked them how to go, and their jaw was on, their collective jaw was on the floor. They said to me, these people don't have any problem telling us how much they drink, and they drink a lot. What people are denying is a stigmatizing label. Given, given a situation where they don't feel that they're going to be beat over the head with a diagnosis, that they're going to be working with somebody who cares about them, um, they'll tell you how much they're drinking. So um, in terms of self-report, um, self-report uh, varies by the demand characteristics in, in the situation that it's asked. I'll give you two examples. If you were driving and you were stopped and the policeman asked you to roll down your window and he gave you the audit and you'd been drinking, you'd lie on, on every question. You'd, you, you know, you'd, you'd underestimate how much you'd been drinking. And that's because the demand characteristics of this situation are that if you report that you're drinking a lot, you're going to get a, a major negative consequence. In medical settings, in a, as a general rule, and there's been a fair amount of research on this, if you ask patients how much they're drinking in a reasonable way, by and large, they'll tell you the truth because they don't think that it's going to uh, that it's going to hurt them, that they're going to be a major, major ne negative consequence as a result of it. And there are times that people actually over-report, and that's when people want to get into treatment. If somebody wants to get into treatment and they know that there's limited treatment spot spots, they over-report by a great deal how much drug or alcohol or whatever they're using because they're competing for for uh, a limited spot in treatment. So it's not, it's, you know, the, the things that affect the validity of self-report are partly the demand characteristics of the situation in which the questions are asked. And the medical situation is a, is a relatively neutral situation. I hope that's helpful. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Hunterford. That is going to be our last question for today. Um, if anyone else has any additional questions, feel free to send them into the questions box now, and I will take them down and share them with Dr. Hungerford following the webinar. Uh, now I'm going to take the screen back here from you, Dr. Hungerford. I'm just going to go over a couple of housekeeping items. So again, I want to thank everyone for their participation today, and I want to thank Dr. Hungerford for such a great webinar. At this time, I'd like to go over our evaluation and CEU instructions. You are going to receive a few emails from us following this webinar. In these emails will be a link to the recording of the webinar, as well as a PDF version of today's slides. Uh, also included in the email is a link to the evaluation. Our grant evaluators are required and pleased to collect feedback from all event participants. Completion of this evaluation is critical to maintain our funding and continuing to provide quality education and materials. Your participation is appreciated, and the evaluation should take no more than two minutes of your time. Immediately following the evaluation is a request form for a certificate of attendance, or a NADAC or PACADC CEU. If you choose to skip the evaluation and proceed directly to the CEU request page, simply leave all of the answers on the evaluation blank. Again, we want to thank you for your participation today. If you do have any other follow-up questions, please feel free to email us at info at IRETA.org. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Hungerford. Thank you. I wonder how it went. It's hard in a webinar. You can't see people react. Oops, just give me one. I think it went very well. We're getting good feedback here. We are still live, okay?
Oh, you mean they can hear me? They can, yes. But I can read some of the <laughs> feedback coming in here. Uh, thank you very much. This was a great webinar. Uh, we learned a lot. Throughout the webinar, we did have some uh, additional requests for the PowerPoint slides, uh, noting that it was ex excellent information um, that they certainly wanted to be able to refer back to after the webinar. So great job. Um, I think it's going to take me a while to, to get out uh, the uh, PDF slides because I'd like to put in the notes section enough information that people could follow up on any given point. And it, uh, a lot of that I know off the top of my head, but I, I'd like to document it in the notes section so that it would be helpful for people, and that'll take a few days. Okay, that's no problem. I'll let all the attendees know that. Um, at this point, I'm going to close the webinar. Um, and Dr. Hungerford, if you have any additional questions for me, we can just follow up the email, or feel free to just give my office line a call. Great, thanks. Okay, thank you.